Welcome to Case of the Week number five, Necrotizing Pancreatitis. I'm Dr. Dan Colville from Radiologist HQ. So we'll start with the CT scan here, and then I'll finish with some key points at the end. So this is a contrast-enhanced CT of the upper abdomen. We're looking at the liver here, and it's hypodense, indicating that there is hepatic steatosis. There's also some trace perihepatic ascites here, but there's more pronounced fluid along the left anterior renal fascia tracking about the spleen. As we scroll inferiorly, you can see that that is due to an enlarged edematous pancreatic body and tail, which is markedly hypoenhancing. There's also quite a bit of peripancreatic edema and stranding. Here we can see the gastroduodenal artery in the pancreatic head. That looks normal. And scrolling inferiorly, you can now get a sense that there's some more normal pancreatic parenchyma here in the pancreatic head. Look at how that's enhancing normally and compare that to this hypoenhancing or non-enhancing area more superiorly in the pancreatic head. And also, we're just seeing more of that peripancreatic fluid and edema as we track inferiorly. Jumping ahead to the coronal reformatted images, we can again see that perihepatic ascites, but the more extensive peripancreatic edema and fluid. And the coronal reformats are a great way to look at the pancreas because you can see much of it on a single view. And look at how sharply defined that interface is between the normal enhancing pancreas here at the inferior aspect of the pancreatic head and then the remaining hypoattenuating pancreas. You can see that sharp line there. So this is the area where we have necrotizing pancreatitis with some sparing here in the pancreatic head. Coronals are also a great way to look at the duodenal sweep here. You can see this duodenal C loop extending down here with the pancreatic head. This area between the pancreatic head and the duodenum is known as the pancreaticoduodenal groove, which has a bit of fluid within it. And there's also some reactive duodenitis here, reactive inflammatory changes from the extensive pancreatitis. And do you notice anything else? It's a subtle finding on these images. There's some non-occlusive thrombus here in the splenic vein, also here a bit more closely associated with the portal splenic confluence. So that's something that's also on my checklist for the coronal reformatted images, is looking at the portal veins, the splenic vein, and then also the mesenteric veins. You can see the super mesenteric vein here extending down because it gives you a great look at much of the vein in one image. So it's much easier to pick up thrombus, which is a potential complication of pancreatitis. Now, one week later, the patient had a follow-up CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, and you could see that there's some increased periapatic ascites here. As we scroll inferiorly, you notice that there's a large fluid collection here at the pancreatic tail with mass effect against the posterior wall of the stomach. The pancreas remains markedly hypoattenuating, expanded, and edematous with all this peripancreatic stranding, so we have ongoing pancreatic necrosis. So when you have a fluid collection in the setting of necrotizing pancreatitis, and if it's been four weeks or less since the onset of pancreatitis, that would be known as an acute necrotic collection. So that's what we have here. And looking at the pancreatic vascular structures, we can see the splenic artery here in the pancreatic tail and also the gastroduodenal artery here in the pancreatic head. So we see no evidence of pseudoaneurysm formation, which is something we want to look for. Also, the splenic vein looks increasingly diminutive, but it remains patent. Now, as we scroll along inferiorly, the peripancreatic stranding has profoundly increased, and now we don't only have pancreatic necrosis, but we have peripancreatic necrosis. That's what we're seeing throughout here in the mesentery extending out into the omentum. And again, there's the renal infarcts on the left. Now, the patient improved clinically and then had a follow-up MRI three months later. So here we have an axial T2 image through the upper abdomen. You could tell that it's a T2-weighted image because the fluid in the spinal canal, the CSF, is bright, and fluid will be bright, simple fluid, on T2-weighted images, also here in the stomach. And here we have the flow void from the intact splenic artery here. As we scroll inferiorly, what do you see? Well, there's that large fluid collection again. It looks smaller now and smoothly demarcated. It looks simple. It's very homogeneous and T2 hyperintense, and but it's replacing the pancreatic tail. Here's some normal pancreatic parenchyma in the head, right here as we scroll inferiorly. And now, if we have a fluid collection in the pancreas where we had necrotizing pancreatitis and more than four weeks have passed, we now call this walled-off pancreatic necrosis. Walled-off necrosis. So that's what we have here. Now, if we look at the arterial phase series from the same patient, here we get a better look at the splenic artery. It looks intact. It's often very tortuous here. There's the celiac artery, which the splenic artery is derived from. We don't see any enhancement within this pancreatic collection. 
We also though don't see any normal enhancing pancreatic tail. Because of the necrosis, it's been replaced by this cystic structure. We see that there is some normal enhancement in the pancreatic head, which we saw spared initially. So the pancreas parenchyma will often enhance quite robustly on early post-contrast imaging. And that's also the same phase where we'll see nice cortical medullary enhancement of the kidney here, where you see the differentiation between the cortex, which is enhancing, and the medullary pyramids, which are not. That's also a great way to look at the normal renal anatomy, because what are you seeing on the left here? Well, where we had those renal infarcts, we're now seeing these areas of scarring. We have intact cortex here, but here we've lost cortex, and then it's atrophic and lobulated. So that's what we sometimes see as infarcts resolve. All right, let's look at some key points for necrotizing pancreatitis. So there are two types of acute pancreatitis, and that was established by the revised Atlanta classification back in 2012. So Interstitial edematous pancreatitis is when we just have edema involving the pancreatic parenchyma, which otherwise enhances normally. That's the kind of run-of-the-mill type of pancreatitis. And with that, if you have a fluid collection in the first four weeks, that's known as an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. But after four weeks, you would call that same collection a pseudocyst. And what we had in this case was the other type of pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis. In that case, when you have a fluid collection in the first four weeks, it's known as an acute necrotic collection. After four weeks, you would call it Waldorf necrosis. So that's the delineation between those two types. And the way you identify necrotizing pancreatitis is looking for those areas of non-enhancing hypoattenuation. Furthermore, you also want to look for any gas because that may raise your suspicion for infection or emphysematous pancreatitis. And generally, the term pancreatic abscess is now discouraged. It's better to more specifically say, oh, it's an infected pseudocyst or it's infected Waldorf necrosis instead of just calling it an abscess. And necrotic pancreatitis is more likely to be complicated by superinfection. So there are actually two types of necrotizing pancreatitis. There's the parenchymal type, which just involves the pancreas, and then there's also the parapancreatic type extending into the mesenteric and omental fat. And you can also have both, as we had in this case. So other findings you want to look for when you are reading any pancreatitis case is vascular complications. And with that, we can commonly see venous thrombosis, which typically involves the splenic vein, also portal and mesenteric veins. Less commonly, but critically important, is to detect any pseudoaneurysm involvement, which will typically involve the splenic and gastroduodenal arteries because those arteries pass directly through the pancreatic parenchyma. Thanks for watching Case of the Week number 5, Necrotizing Pancreatitis. You can catch these lectures each week by subscribing to our podcast, YouTube channel, or following on social media. Until next time, remember, radiology is life.